we'll talk about uh, CPU utilization and, and problems that we faced uh, uh, scaling quick on Linux. So uh, my affiliation is Fastly, uh, but I used to be at Google, so a lot of the stuff that I'm going to talk about are experiences that I had, that we had uh, while deploying quick at Google. Um, there's a fairly detailed paper that we published at SICOM last year, uh, and I encourage you, if you're interested in more data and more detailed uh, evaluation uh, with uh, off quick, I encourage you to go pick up the paper and take a look. We'll touch upon some of these things, but we won't get into the details uh, of performance evaluation outside of CPU here. So uh, let's start with a very quick history. Um, Quick was developed as a, an HTTPS transport um, at Google, and it started deployment in, in 2014. Um, and the deployment was between all Google services and Chrome as the client, and also mobile apps, apps that Google shipped, such as Google Search app, YouTube app, and so on and so forth. So the deployment started in 2014 at a slow burn, and uh, we saw a fair amount of improved application performance. Um, as we deployed Quick, we saw YouTube video rebuffers went down, or, or the improvement uh, was 15 to 18% with Quick over TLS and TCP. And Google search latency went down by 36 to 8%. Again, I'm not going to go into the details of the distributions and so on. They are all there in the paper. But this is a summary of the benefits that we saw with Quick. So obviously, we wanted more Quick, more traffic to be using Quick, and that's what we did. And uh, uh, as of about a year ago, 35% of Google's egress traffic was quick. Um, that's increased, but that's what the, the numbers are from about a year ago. And that's about 7% of, of internet traffic globally. This is why quick should be of interest to this group. Um, it's effectively a, a transport that that's, uh, has wide deployment and, and as I will describe the IETF process and, and other participants in the IETF process, we expect this number to grow. The IETF um, has started, uh, so we, we created a quick working group in the IETF in October of 2016, which has been going very strong. There's been a lot of work in the, in the standards group to modularize and standardize quick, and I'll talk a brief bit about uh, these changes um, in, in subsequent slides. So, Let's look at very briefly how a quick deployment looked at Google. So this is in 2015, um, and we started to deploy quick and slowly increased it. We had controls. Again, uh, these controls and the way that we deployed this is described in the paper, but in, in, uh, very briefly, we were able to control the amount of quick that we were serving. Um, so Percent egress slowly increased as we you know, saw improvements and nothing broke terribly. We kept increasing it steadily um, until some point when we decided we had to turn off quick. Um, this was a, a crypto bug at the client. We, f we found it, turned off quick immediately. Uh, it was a very rare, uh, uh, um, a bug that had very rare occurrence, but we wanted to make sure that we ironed it out before deploying quick. So we turned it off. We fixed it and shipped uh, uh, it out again in January of 2016, and you can see that uh, that that quick ramp up again of quick after that point. Um, and deployment was steady up until like August of 2016, when we saw a huge increase in quick traffic. Anybody want to venture a guess what that might be? This is me checking to see if you're all still awake. And if you're not, wake up. Was it YouTube? Was it YouTube? Says, says Tim Shepard. It, it, it was, but more precisely, this was all, YouTube is a lot of the traffic even before then. Olympics. Was it the Olympics? The Olympics didn't last for five months. I'll answer it. This is uh, um, YouTube on YouTube mobile app on, on, uh, on Android. So this was basically YouTube mobile, specifically. So we launched it to uh, full, uh, full throttle on, on, on mobile, and that bump is because of mobile. So if you're all wondering where mobile is, it's a lot of our traffic. Um, a lot of the internet's traffic is, in fact, on mobile. Um, 
So what are we talking about? What is Quick? How many people here, by the way, know Quick really well? <laughs> Somewhat well. How many of you heard of it before you walked into this room today? Okay, good. Some of this will actually be useful then. Um, so what is Quick? That's your, your, your standard HTTPS serving stack. You have HTTP 2 in this particular case, uh, uh, running on top of TLS, running on top of TCP, which runs on top of IP, and that's your nice little internet stack. That's what we all love and use. Quick eats up a whole bunch of it. Um, so Quick effectively uh, gives the same service as you would have gotten sitting on top of HTTP 2 there, but it gives you, uh, 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 gives that, it subsumes a big chunk of HTTP 2, TLS, and TCP, and it runs over UDP. Now what you're seeing here, what I'm calling GQuick, is a newer uh, 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 subtle differentiation that I'm gonna make now. This is Google's implementation of Quick, Google's deployment of Quick. I'm, I'm, I'm calling it GQuick because we now have Quick at the IETF, which is really what we are calling Quick. So to separate this out, we are calling this particular version of Quick GQuick. And I'll talk about that briefly again later. But um, GQuick, as we had it at Google, had this thing called Quick Crypto, which effectively replaced TLS. It was a completely different protocol. It was a new handshake protocol, and it worked in consort with Quick to uh, n not just to uh, exchange keys, but also to uh, encrypt packets and everything else. Um, and HTTP ran on top of that. So we had a mapping that allowed us to provide the same service as you would have gotten over HTTP 2, but with a completely different little shim sitting on top of Quick. And of course, it all ran on top of UDP. The work at the IETF has been to standardize this and to modularize this and to standardize this in a way that people can use existing components, existing standards, instead of having to build everything brand new. And so um, the IETF Quick, which is what this figure shows, has TLS 1.3 effectively as the handshake protocol. So we are standardizing Quick with TLS 1.3, and that's where the future is going to be. Um, all Quick implementations are going to be used are using TLS 1.3 now. Even GQuick is moving there, and uh, the Quick protocol itself has changed in in in, in subtle ways, but in not not significantly in terms of performance changing ways. So we expect that a lot of the all of the performance benefits that we talk about here will continue to hold as we go into IETF Quick. Um, so these are the drafts the IETF drafts that describe these components. Um, and I won't go into the details here. Again, you can look them up. So the outline of the rest of the talk is this. Uh, I'll talk for just a couple of slides on quick design and about uh, some experiments and experiences that we've had deploying, building and deploying quick. Um, and I hope those are those were enlightening to us. Some of them were enlightening to us, for sure. Some of them we expected, but some of them were absolutely uh, um, surprising to us. And then we'll talk about uh, scaling quick on Linux, the pain points that we had, what we've done since, and what remains to be done. So um, Quick's design goals, uh, the first design goal that we had in Quick was deployability and evolvability. We wanted Quick to be built and shipped within our lifetimes actually within the order of a year or so, right? Like, so we wanted it to be shipped as quickly as possible and we wanted it shipped on the internet as quickly as possible. We weren't wanting to wait for uh, operating, system, uh, uh, um, operating systems on the client side to pick it up, for middle boxes to pick it up. So the obvious uh, uh, thing for us to do was to layer this on top of UDP. We could ship it immediately on the clients because at Google, we, uh, we were able to ship this inside of Chrome and inside of mobile clients, and that way we didn't need or require operating system support for Quick. We had the UDP interface. Um, in addition, it allowed us to get through middle boxes, and that was one of the biggest problems. Now, I personally have worked with the CTP for, an, have, uh, had worked with SCTP for a number of years, and uh, a lot of the problems that plagued SCTP deployment were, are good things to avoid. One of those things is having to modify NATs and middle boxes. Layering this on top of UDP allows you to get through a whole bunch of middle boxes. We have data on UDP reachability if you're interested, um, uh, but yeah, ask if you're interested. Um, 
so we wanted to make sure that we could get this deployed, so we layered this on top of UDP. We wanted to make sure that this was not going to get ossified in the future. And so we encrypted and authenticated all the headers, the protocol headers, so that middle boxes could not write to them or modify them. And those are things that have continued to remain a strong um, um, philosophies and quick going through the IETF process. In fact, to some degree, they've gotten strengthened. There are more pieces of the quick header that have gotten encrypted and hidden. Um, low latency secure, low latency and secure connection establishment was critical to us. We wanted to reduce latency. That was one of the big important goals uh, of Quick was to was to make the transport itself a low latency platform on which you build services. So we basically built in a zero RTD uh, handshake in Quick Crypto that's carried on to TLS 1.3, um, and we basically it's roughly similar to running TCP fast open plus TLS 1.3 with the uh, with the additional uh, benefit that with um, with quick zero RTD, you can send more than one packet in the first round trip time, which you can't with TCP fast open. Um, quick provides stream and streams and multiplexing. If you're familiar with uh, what SCTP or HTTP2 provided, you, rough, you know the idea of streams, but I'll, I'll, I'll give you a very brief summary. Streams are basically lightweight abstractions within an existing connection. What is a connection? A connection is uh, a, a, a security context, a crypto context. It's a congestion control context at this point. And it's also potentially a, it, it also has a, um, a flow control context. Within that, you can, you can have streams that allow uh, a receiver to receive packets out of order. You, are a fam you may be familiar with the TCP in order head offline blocking problem where if one packet is lost, subsequent packets are held up in, at the receiver and they do not get delivered. This problem is solved when we have something like streams within a connection because the receiver is able to deliver data that's received within a stream in order as long as it's an order within that stream. So it's really uh, an API thing. It's an abstraction that an application can use if it wants to. It doesn't improve on the wire performance as much as it improves head offline blocking or reduces head offline blocking and receiver side blocking performance. Quick uh, also has better loss recovery. Um, we basically learned from TCP. Right? I mean, we had years of experience with TCP. We've seen everything that's gone into TCP over the years and how many things have been hacked into it uh, to try and fit within the existing uh, protocol framework. And we were able to simply basically build them up from scratch with the right signaling. So we just happen to have better loss recovery because we happen to be able to learn from TCP's uh, experiences. And we were able to build in richer signaling, such as we do not have the retransmission ambiguity problem because a new packet gets a new sequence number, a new packet number, we call them in, in quick. We've separated send ordering from receive ordering. What I mean is, in, in, so in TCP, you have one sequence number that's used for sending as well as for receiving. So when you retransmit a packet, the same sequence number goes on the retransmission. In Quick, if you retransmit a packet, the contents of the packet are retransmitted, but the packet itself is brand new, and it gets a new packet number. So packet numbers going out are monotonically increasing. On the receive side, you open up the packet, and the delivery sequence number is inside. It's per stream. So we've separated those two concepts and, those, and, the, and that allows us to do a lot of more interesting things with loss recovery. Um, the implementation uh, in Chromium also has fairly flexible congestion control. And in general, we are encouraging implementers to keep the congestion control API open and, and flexible so that we can do uh, experimentation. They can do experimentation with congestion control moving forward. Um, Quick has the ability to support Connection migration and multipath. Uh, the protocol now supports connection migration, not multipath fully yet, but uh, it uses an explicit 18 byte up to 18 byte connection ID that is used to identify the connection. This is separate from the four tuple. The four tuple is useful at the beginning when you're setting up the connection, but after that, Quick relies on uh, the connection ID for routing and for various things. So um, as long as you have the connection ID, even if the four tuple changes, perhaps because of NAT rebinding, UDP has, uh, uh, does, if you're familiar with NATs and how NATs work, 
and that's basically map your internal four tuple to an external four tuple or your internal IP address and port to an external IP address and port, a public IP address and port. And that binding can change if there's a pause in the connection. That typically in TCP tends to be that pause it can be longer because those NATs look for fins to go through to drop state, but in UDP they don't know when the connection is over, so they tend to have more aggressive timeouts. So we wanted to build this into into Quick. So this allows provides a connection better resilience against NAT rebinding, but that also gives us the ability to migrate connections to new IP addresses. And the same thing can also allow us to do things like multipath. Again, you, as long as you have a connection identifier that's distinct from the four tuple, there are a lot of things you can do. You can change the four tuple, you can use multiple four tuples. There are things that one could do. Currently, the protocol allows for connection migration. We expect that uh, the next version of the protocol will, will, will support multipath. So I'm not going to go into the details of, like I said, the performance evaluation, but there's one set of numbers that I want to want to show you. And this is perhaps, um, uh, I think, one of the more, um, I think it's, it's, it, it, it shows something that's valuable. So if you look at quick improvement, uh, uh, it's like I showed you, the, the main numbers are there, but geographically, it's not equal. And that's an interesting thing to, to, to look at. So if you look at South Korea, which has excellent connectivity overall, the, the mean min RTD, as we measured, is about 38 milliseconds. The retransmit rate for TCP connections is about 1%, which is, which is really good, by the way. Um, there's not very much in improvement. Um, the reduction in rebuffer rate is an improvement. Uh, again, rebuffers are basically things that you don't want. This is the amount of time that you look at the spinny wheel when you're watching a video. That's basically what a rebuffer rate is. So, the lesser time you're looking at the spinning wheel, the better it is. So this improvement is, is effective goodness. And this, this uh, uh, you do see improvement on mobile, but on desktop, it's basically zero. If you go to the US, which has a crappier network than, than South Korea and many other countries, um, it's, um, you see the improvements start to increase. It's when you get to places like India, which have really crappy connectivity, that you see the bulk of uh, Quick's improvement. So what this really tells you is that Quick pulls in the tail. Quick is really, really, a lot of the mean there, the weight is in the tail. And this is the tail we care about. We care about improving connectivity for, for users who have terribly sucky connectivity. We care about improving transport performance over poor links because those users don't have very many other options. So I did want to show you the slide because I wanted to show you that Quick is an improving performance for all of us here who have, you know, really good connectivity. It's actually improving performance for users who have crappy connectivity and users who we all care about improving the uh, improving performance for. So I'm going to move to just a few uh, experiments and experiences. Uh, again, there's, these are all of these are actually described in the paper as well, but. Um, one in particular that I find very, uh, uh, that we were surprised by was we thought that we'd encrypt the headers and Quick wouldn't get ossified. Which is a great thing to think about. And, 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 and we said, uh, we had, uh, like I said, authenticated all the headers, encrypted some of them. So we didn't encrypt all the headers. Some of them had to be left visible of course, they couldn't be modified, but they were left visible. What happened is that the first byte, the flags byte, when we flipped a flag in there, suddenly Chrome couldn't reach, you could, you could not use Chrome to reach Google anymore. This happened. And um, the problem was that there was a particular um, firewall vendor who had decided to build a quick classifier. And the way they built the quick classifier was they looked on the wire at TCP dump and said, it looks like all quick traffic has seven as the first byte. So guess what my classifier is going to be? The first byte is seven, it's quick. Not probably, it's quick. Um, and so when we change the first byte from seven to something, it's a flags byte. We, change, we flipped a flag. Suddenly, the middle box would allow the handshake to go through and then black hole everything else. Now this was the worst for us because we, so in Chrome, Chrome would raise TCP and quick connections and if the quick connection handshake went through, it would say quick works, I'm gonna to switch to using quick. This firewall 
happily allowed the handshake to go through and then said, I still don't know what this, I, I look at this packet and go, I don't know what this is, but I'm gonna let it through. Back comes a packet, I don't know what it is, but I'm gonna let it through. And now decides, probably because the decision-making process is happening on a separate thread somewhere, where it goes, I'm not gonna let this, this, this traffic through anymore and black hold uh, subsequent packets on that fortable. So we basically had a, uh, uh, we had to roll back, we talked to the firewall vendor who had never seen the quick spec, did not know what it was, but built a classifier anyways. This is the ossification that we are up against. This was surprising to us because we had, we had this was before the IETF process happened, this was in 2015? 15 or 16, yeah. So it was before the uh, um, ITF process had started. So there was not a, there was the quick uh, design document that we had was public, but they decided to build a classifier for a proprietary protocol without consulting the documentation. Um, and so we realized that even getting them to actually read the documentation is already a task that we would like to see if we can bake into the protocol. And that's some of some work that's that's gone into that into the in the ITF work, um, but. Ultimately, we realized that was, for me at least, a moment of like, yeah, um, uh, this, there's a quote here from the Tussles paper, which if you haven't read, please go read it, which says, the ultimate defense of the end-to-end -end mode is end-to-end -end encryption. And that's been a guiding principle for us. Um, this uh, 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 slide shows basically how rapidly we, had, we have iterated on Quick uh, over time. And the colors you're seeing here are basically um, versions and the fraction of traffic on the y-axis. So you're seeing how quickly we were able to deploy uh, different quick versions, largely because we were operating in user space. Um, we were basically shipping uh, um, changes to Chromium on a six-weekly cycle, and we were changing our server, um, um, our, our, our user, user space server implementation also rapidly, so we were able to move quite faster, quite fast uh, with, with uh, sh uh, shipping new versions. We were also able to use a lot of uh, um, 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 tools that, were that are available in user space, and that really helped us make the implementation quite solid. Being in user space also allowed us to do better integration with tracing and logging infrastructure that most server deployments have. Most server deployments have pretty rich infrastructure when it comes to logging, and, and all of that tends to live in user space. So being in user space allowed us to integrate with them seamlessly and quite rapidly. Um, I'm not gonna go into this. This seems like a, like, I mean, we can talk about this. If anybody's interested about the FEC experiments we had with Quick, we implemented and then turned it off. I'm happy to talk about that later, but come up and ask if you want to talk about this. Um, we spent a lot of time in that period before the massive ramp up with mobile uh, on improving Quick's CPU utilization because that was necessary before we could allow, we could, we could serve that much traffic on Quick. And to talk about the details in that particular period where we reduced Quick's um, um, CPU footprint from 3.5x to 2x. I'll hand it off to Ian. Careful there. Uh, yeah, so I mean, it's what I do still work at Google. Uh, so, <laughs> but uh, yeah, John I left relatively recently. Um, so there were some major sources for uh, CPU utilization uh, when we got to in the 3.5x, 2x range. Uh, crypto was a pretty big one. Um, at the time, we were using a fair amount of ChaCha20, and if you're familiar, uh, ChaCha20 does not have AES and I instructions, because obviously it's not AES, um, but it is quite a bit faster on a lot of mobile devices, which also don't have AES uh, acceleration. Um, and so by default, if the mobile device uh, didn't have AES instructions, we would use ChaCha20. Uh, so that was kind of costly. Uh, sending and receiving UDP were by far the, the largest costs um, and even today, those are still the largest costs. Um, the internal state of QUIC um, is definitely a lot less cache efficient uh, than the current TCP code. Uh, that makes sense. You know, it's four years old and rapidly evolving, whereas the TCP code is much, much older, and um, people have spent an extensive amount of time optimizing it. Um, and so, in the in the worst case scenario, one person actually said, who uh, formerly worked at Intel, said that. Uh, Quick is actually a visitor framework that happens to implement a networking transport. Uh, <laughs> so, because there are quite a few callbacks and such, and a fair amount of indirection, so you know there's a fair amount of work to to mitigate that. Uh, Quick also has encrypted acknowledgments, 
Um, and so not only are they encrypted, but the cost of processing kind of an acknowledgement in quick is a little bit higher than TCP anyway, due to kind of how the data structure is laid out. Um, so that, that's a little more costly. So what did we do? Uh, for Cha Cha 20, it was actually, <laughs> it was easy from my perspective. I asked David Benjamin from Boring SSL to land some ham optimized assembly and um, he uh, you know, nicely did that for me, and then uh, everything was pretty much fine. Uh, particularly on uh, places where we have AVX now, uh, ChaCha20 is is quite fast. Uh, for, fairly comparable to AV, ASGCM, actually. Uh, In place crypto uh, also helped. Uh, we were a little surprised to see that, but I think uh, a lot of our machines are actually memory bandwidth limited, so uh, just touching one little chunk less memory is helpful. On the send and receive side, um, a while ago, we actually switched to using uh, packet RX ring, uh, and that was actually a, quite a substantial CPU savings. Um, my memory at the time is that it was kind of a about a 10% win overall is the is the ballpark we're talking. So, so pretty substantial. Um, we've more recently tried some experiments uh, switching back to UDP sockets, but it turns out at least at the moment it's still still a win to use uh, RX ring. Um, and more recently, UDP GSO is landed, uh, and that is very, very promising. We don't have it uh, fully deployed yet. Uh, I'm gonna talk about it a little bit more in detail later, but uh, that's uh, you know an incredible improvement in terms of the overall send performance because uh, today it's not that uncommon for us to consume something on the order of 30% of our CPU just sending UDP packets on a server. Um, it kind of depends on the environment, but uh, and we've seen as high as 50, but that was a particularly pathological Android device. Uh, so quick internal state. Um, yeah, we optimized for cache efficiency. Uh, we redid all of our data structures to, you know, use uh, you know double-ended queues and vectors and other things that are much more cache efficient. Um, and of course, we minimized allocations in mem copy. So standard stuff that I'm sure you're all familiar with. Uh, we also de-virtualized some things and you know, uh, made things uh, you know, minimized interfaces and pointer following. Uh, an encrypted ACKS. Uh, so the solution to this one was not to really, was, we did actually make ACK processing quite a bit faster recently, uh, but the main solution was just to send fewer of them. Uh, so we now have this uh, feature called ACK decimation. Uh, it doesn't actually reduce ACKS by one-tenth, but it turns out decimation doesn't mean that anyway, long story. Um, uh, but it does reduce the ACK rate to either every 10 packets or one quarter of an RTT, uh, whichever comes first. Uh, and that reduces CPU utilization quite a bit, and it gets to the point where, uh, you know, in, at least in theory, the ACK processing cost of uh, Quick and TCP should be quite comparable. There we go. Um, so here, here's how kind of I would recommend uh, the use of sockets at the moment for Quick. This is how we're doing it. Um, certainly, there are other ways to go, and we've we've considered a lot of options, but. Um, and this, this knowledge is sort of gathered from various kernel developers at Google, like Eric and uh, Willem, and um, you know, I, I trust their advice to a large extent, and if I misquote them, then they should feel free to correct me. Um, so the current model is that we're using a socket per thread on, uh, with SO reuse port on the receive side. So this is basically a receive-only socket. Uh, it does not ever send packets. Uh, this provides a staple uh, forgeable hash among flows. Uh, most of the time, that you know, it works out very well. Um, and then the app dispatches based on quick connection ID. Um, so for NAT rebinding, uh, we've actually found that connection migration, and sorry, NAT rebinding and connection migration combined are much less than 1% of all uh, active connections. Uh, so that might increase a little bit as connection migration prevalence increases, but I still think we're talking about less than 1% of connections. Um, so re relying on four tuple is largely adequate, at least from a computational perspective. You can sort of optimize for the fast path case and do four tuple uh, flow hashing for, for quite a while. Um, and then you can either toss packets between threads if necessary, or potentially you can uh, look into using a BPF uh, to provide connection ID based steering. So uh, on the send side, uh, we're also using a socket per thread for sending. Um, at the moment, actually, it turns out we're using uh, raw sockets because we want to do some GRE and MPLS in certain circumstances, but that's sort of a detail. Um, we have found, actually, raw sockets are very slightly faster than UDP sockets, at least in some circumstances, but it's not a completely cl clear to me why. So, uh, you know, if someone can elucidate that, that'd certainly be interesting. Um, but, uh, 
you know, we found that basically using a, a, a socket per connection was, was basically impractical uh, for a variety of reasons, and it wasn't really helpful. Um, so there are some issues with this approach. Uh, we can't use FQ pacing, uh, even though we have the QDisk installed, uh, because we have many, many flows that share a socket, and there's no possible way that there is a correct pacing rate for all of them. Uh, we need an extra large send buffer, because we have so many flows, uh, to avoid constantly getting write blocked. Um, and actually, the kind of the worst practical problem is that the FQ QDisk kind of creates an inherent unfairness between Quick and TCP once the NIC starts getting limited, uh, because you're, you know, basically a thousand Quick flows might be competing against one TCP flow uh, for egress time on the NIC. So, um, you know, most of the time, obviously, you don't want to run your NIC at 100% anyway. So as long as you're not running your NIC, like, you know, literally over the, the NIC clock rate, it's, it's largely fine. But there are a few locations where things get hot, especially if uh, something else and some other piece of hardware breaks. Um, as I mentioned before, packet sockets with shared memory are, are still a substantial re re uh, improvement over plain SO reuse port. Um, you know, it's very possible that might be something we can improve on in the future, but um, at the moment we're continuing to, to use them. Um, packet sockets with a TX ring were not really a big win, at least when we tested them the last time. It's not really clear why. Um, but most importantly, using packet sockets for send is an enormous pain in the ass, for lack of a better word. Like the number of issues we had, um, it's, it's a lot of work. So the, uh, I'm sure, you know, it all makes sense that that's true now, but um, we thought we had environments where we, you know, the, the extra CPU benefit of using packet sockets would be beneficial, um, and the hassle was, was substantial. Uh, and there were a lot of edge case issues that we just did not anticipate. Um, so even using raw sockets versus packet sockets is, is massively easier. Um, but using packet sockets on receive side is quite simple. So listen learned. Um, so now we have UDP GSO. Uh, it achieves performance that's pretty similar to TCP um, for UDP sending. Uh, and it's, well, I think Willem's benchmark said like 2.75 times faster, but you know, it's approximately three times faster uh, than current UDP sending uh, without GSO. Uh, it does release all the datagrams that you send at once. Um, so based on my math, that means you don't get the full CPU savings of sending 64K at one millisecond intervals uh, until you hit 512 megabits per second. Um, so you basically either have to choose between kind of a, a much more lumpy send pattern than you might ideally like or uh, not getting the full CPU benefits. And so that's sort of the trade-off we're, we're trying to balance right now as we deploy this. Um, but yeah, ideally in the future, um, it would be possible to actually split up one of these segments after Quick sends it uh, into the kernel, and that would mitigate the, the packet loss issue. Um, so as an example, um, I think recently we did some experiments where we kind of forced <laughs> Quick to send bur you know, in bursts. And I think if you forced it to send in 16 packet bursts, uh, the retransmit rate went up on the order of 15 to 20% in some locations. Um, in other locations, it didn't go up very much at all. Um, but in those locations, you also had a much smaller CPU benefit. So there's this kind of trade-off that um, the, uh, you know, larger sends are cheaper, obviously, uh, but more likely to cause, cause loss. Oh. There you go. Packet pacing. Uh, as Van said much better than I can, um, minimum release time based pacing is awesome. Um, and is, I'm very excited to see it coming to the Linux kernel. Um, it's a... Uh, it makes you know reasoning about congestion control like much much easier. It makes kind of controlling how much queue you have in front of you much much easier. Um, and in theory, it should be possible to implement it much more efficiently uh, than a lot of other pacing schemes. Um, and it works out really well, ideally for quick, because you know instead of having this shared socket where I actually have a queue with a queue disk and a queuing discipline um, that's you know among many many connections, I can actually each connection can say I want to send it this time, I want to send it this time, all using the same socket. Um, so I kind of put some links down there to the um, transmit time patch. Uh, the FQ patch that uh, I think Eric was going to send out, I haven't grabbed a link for, but um, we do actually have Chromium pacing offload code already written uh, in Quick. Um, so there's, all the code is wired up in the open source code to take advantage of um, any uh, a packet writer that actually can do um, release time based offload. 
and it works. We've done some like sample tests just to make sure the code actually works as intended. Uh, it seems to work well. So, uh, the dream for send side, at least from my perspective, is you'd have some set of shared memory buffers uh, between Quick and the NetStack. Um, you know, the, net, the Quick would tell the NetStack what the symmetric key is. Once Quick goes forward secure and gets one RTT keys, and then each packet would have a release time. Um, and you'd have some sort of uh, timing wheel or other data structure inside the net stack that would be, you know, managing this release time based uh, pacing, and then, you know, the net stack would, would copy it onto the NIC uh, appropriately. So, you know, this would, you'd still have one copy in this uh, architecture, you know, from the shared memory to the NIC. Um, but possibly, you know, that copy could also be where you do the crypto. I don't know. I'm certainly not uh, an expert on NICs. But, but something along this model is sort of, sort of where um, I would hope to, to see things go in the long term. Um, so what, what do we need to do? Or what, what might we want to do to make things better? Uh, so on the receive side, um, uh, I know Willem and a few others have talked about possibly doing uh, UDP LRO. Um, so that might make a regular UDP socket that doesn't have escalated privileges uh, as fast as packet sockets. Uh, and that would be a nice benefit. Uh, there are a lot of environments where we either are deploying quick or would like to deploy quick where we don't have escalated privileges. Uh, crypto would offload both the API and support for it. Um, I think it's kind of an open issue as to exactly how that API would look, how generic it would be, or whether it would be specific to Quick. Um, I know there are a lot of people talking about it. I think it's an interesting area of improvement, and I, um, you know, it's it's a little bit uh, a matter of you know having the hardware vendors and everyone talk to the Quick developers and make sure that something that works for Google and Facebook and all the various people who are interested in deploying Quick at scale. Uh, it works for all of them. Uh, and then some sort of API to allow uh, pacing multi datagram UDP sends. So, um, you know, some way to, to fragment up the UDP GSO chunks uh, so we don't have to compromise between uh, packet loss and uh, CPU utilization. So, I want to say thanks to um, Willem and Eric in particular who have. Uh, you know, really landed some awesome patches in the last few years. Um, and also, uh, I guess, uh, Jesus uh, recently landed the uh, TX time patch. Um, and anyone else um, who I, I failed to mention who's improved UDP uh, in Linux in the recent past. And Tom Herbert uh, for SO Reusport, which is pretty much totally necessary to make any of this work. <laughs> so, uh, and some IGF drafts are linked to for your information. And now it's questions, unless people want to. Uh, can we line up the mics? It's not break time yet, so you don't get your coffee until you ask questions. Tom. Hi. Uh, thanks for presenting. I think this is uh, very important for the um, community to see a, a protocol like Quick. Um, thing I like about it is alternative to TCP. Um, that's okay, but the part where vendors can't look into transport headers, that's just awesome. So I love that part. Can you go back to the wish list slide? Oh, sure. Uh, back. Did you say that's less awesome? Oh, we're, uh, we're uh, the one after this. This uh, one? Okay, so yep. for the first one, um, so my, uh, my concept for this was we would have some sort of UDP GRO. <laughs> that would uh, dump you into a, a BPF program uh, for ports. So we added uh, capabilities to do per port GRO for things like VXLAN and what have you. Um, but we could have the back end just be a random BPF program with a few BPF helpers you could do GRO. So the advantage of that is now we can support quick GRO in the kernel without actually telling the kernel about quick, which I think is, is a pretty good goal. Uh, number two, I'm wondering how close this would be to all the work we did in KTLS, and then that kind of um, merges into the TLS offload, which becomes a, the API for that is KTLS. So do you, know, do you know how close these would be and whether or not we could kind of leverage those? I think you could leverage a lot of the code that was landed for KTLS, but the, my understanding is the KTLS framing does actual TLS framing on both the send and receive side. Um, and so because quick 
the quick encryption layer looks a little bit different from the TLS uh, layer in terms of kind of what its quote unquote record layer looks like. Um, you, you still require some substantial either modifications or a new API. Um, so it wasn't, I, th I think probably you'd actually need a whole different API, unfortunately, um, yeah, or, yeah, or some the, substantial changes. You need a different framing to be implemented inside the kernel for, for quick packets. Um, yeah, I mean, if you get into that again, that, that would probably be a BPF sort of thing, and then have the BPF helper to call some, mm. some crypto. Um, it's, it's not unreasonable. And I, and I think that the model here for quick in the kernel seems to be, yeah, we, want to, we probably want to do accelerations, but without teaching anything, anything specific to the kernel about quick. Um, and then obviously we want to apply this abstraction to the future protocols, you know, the, the quick replacement or whatever. So um, I think that that model would be good. Uh, KTLS is a little dip, bit different because we did a lot of work and it is in. So um, hopefully there's something we can leverage from that. I think that model actually is, is, is good also because it allows uh, evolution of quick um, uh, and doesn't, evolution of quick doesn't get blocked by newer kernel, uh, new kernels. Well, I mean, so, so quick is just the, the fact that you wanted to do quick because it's UDP and in user, in user space because it can't update kernels. That was a symptom of kind of a larger problem of it, it, it is hard to deploy kernels. We realize that. Um, but then when you go down the programmability path like of XDP and BPF, that actually eventually will kind of evolve yep. to where we can do, we can change the kernel without actually changing the kernel. So yep. that, that's one of the major motivations and why we have so much uh, BPF and XDP discussion because we want that programmability, um, user programmability especially. A comment about uh, the crypto offload API. I think KTLS should fit this quite well because we've built it to be extensible. It supports only TLS 1.2 right now, but for example, extending for TLS 1.3 also requires a change in framing and a lot of similar changes that should be similar to uh, to Quick, uh, I think the main question about Quick uh, crypto offload is whether we are willing to introduce Quick crypto as part of the kernel, uh, meaning that this part is unlikely to be changing frequently over the years, and that's sort of a question if if you are seeing this happening. Uh, the when we talked about this the other day, I think the the thing that I don't think is going to change is the model that there is going to be. Uh, a portion of the packet that is unencrypted and authenticated, and a portion that's going to be encrypted. Um, but there's also things like packet number <laughs> encryption in, in the current ITF specs, which, as we talked about, make things a little more complicated. And so I think uh, what you're really uh, you know, hoping for is that all three of those things are sort of invariants, that there's some portion that's authenticated, there's a packet number that's encrypted in a certain way as a function of the encrypted content. and. I would certainly hope that that remains fairly constant, but you know it's not in the current invariant stock, so you know, I'll, I guess all bets are off technically. Okay, hopefully maybe we can discuss it in the ITF or something, yeah. if that's possible. Uh, I have a question about the slide where you showed the performance differences of uh, TLS and uh, Quick. Uh, you've mentioned it's uh, 3.5x and 2x. What's the, the baseline one? here? That you are comparing to here. The, uh, the oh, the um, the three. That's uh, CPU utilization. So when we started the optimization process around uh, March of 2016, um, Quick was using about 3.5 times as much CPU as TCP uh, with TLS for doing uh, video serving in particular. This is a video serving workload that we're concerned about. Um, and then by the time we got to around August or September, it was uh, closer to 2x. Okay, so it's just the relationship between Q Quick and TLS. There is no baseline that's like 1x uh, TCP or something. No, no. It's, um, I mean, we're continuing to do work to make things better, but uh, getting, uh, getting from 2x to 1x is uh, a little bit harder than uh, getting from 3.5x to 2x. Yeah, the baseline okay. here, though, is uh, serving the same YouTube video traffic over HTTPS, over TLS and TCP. So that's the baseline. So mm. the Quick was consuming almost four times the CPU that, that the TLS stack did, and it got down to about two times. Yeah, I'm asking this because one of the interesting measurements we do when using TLS uh, crypto offload is comparing TLS with bare TCP. And like the baseline there with just software is like 5x, if I remember correctly. But uh, 
I wonder what that is with Quick and, uh, and TLS uh, HTTP in general. Uh, one last question. You've mentioned that uh, Quick works better uh, in countries where uh, the connection is bad. Uh, I wonder what, why that is. Is Quick better at handling, for example, retransmissions or packet reorderings? It's mostly about uh, retransmission ambiguity. So in environments where you have like rack and timestamps enabled and every like um, new TCP, uh, you know, everything's kind of working really well. Uh, the current version of TCP can, can deal with uh, packet loss uh, and ambiguity quite well, but in many deployed environments, um, some all or many of those things are not enabled. Um, and so you know, quick basically like is much uh, better at dealing with repeated retransmissions of the same packet in particular. Um, and that's a fairly common event in places like India where you have high packet loss. Uh, the other situation is that at some point, um, TCP's three SAC windows actually appear to become uh, an actual practical issue uh, in certain environments. And so there are cases when uh, Quick can continue making forward progress and TCP sort of stalls out just because um, you get such like, um, so much packet loss over like little short bursts. So. I should point out that uh, that particular difference, the, those performance numbers are with uh, Cubic, not with BBR. The B BBR numbers, we didn't do a deep evaluation of them afterwards, but uh, the BBR definitely helps close that gap. Yeah. I think, uh, I think uh, Eric, I think Eric had a question or a comment. Yeah, uh, just one comment about the uh, receiver performance on the uh, on Linux. Uh, Linux 4.19 has now the Edward Cree um, improvement about batching the input. So UDP stack will be able to get a batch of packets uh, at once instead of one SKB at a time. So it helps like about 20%. And it should provide better numbers than Jero because Jero doesn't work on the server side because you are receiving packets from the clients at a smaller rate than Jero could afford for the aggregation anyway. So, uh, yeah, so this problem should be solved in a 4.19 kernel. So when you say, Eric, a clarification question, when you say batching, what are you, what are the parameters around which you're batching? Is this just time and the socket to which you'll deliver the packet? Uh, so let's say you have a multi queue NIC, uh, you have one CPU ending uh, for, for, for one queue, and right now the Linux model provides an SKB all the way down to the UDP stack for every incoming packet. Yep. And uh, with the recent patch from Edward Pre, uh, Solar Frere, uh, we are batching all these SKB uh, into a list of SKB, uh, and we don't need to break this list if all these SKB uh, reach the same socket. So basically, it will allow to the stack okay. up the point uh, the, the full batch is delivered to one socket, and it, sh it really helps the performance. It's not yet completed, but um, it should be in the following month, I guess. So this actually means then that a separating out connections socket per connection would defeat this batching, right? We, if you kept all the connections on one socket, you would get better batching. Yeah, so right now the, the quick server uses one yep. socket per thread, so per CPU, yes. so it should really fit this model. It works with that model. Wonderful. Thanks. Great. Thanks. I'll go next. Uh, so my question is on the receive side optimization. So you mentioned, so I'm tempted to believe that uh, the primary optimization came from the use of RX rings versus the reuse port. So so reuse port cannot uh, give that kind of optimization that RX rings can give. But then the problem that I see is it works okay for multi-threaded single process model, but but certain applications such as server-side uh, server applications such as Nginx, which requires, which have multi-worker process model, there it might not work. So, so reuse port is the only option that I have there to make use of, in which case uh, the RX ring uh, cannot be made use of. And I have to depend upon BPF to steer the packet, like you have mentioned in your slide, uh, BPF can be used to steer the packet to the right process. That has to be mandatorily used. Anyways, that has to be mandatorily used for the future for multipath quick to work as well, I, uh, as I believe. NAT rebinding you know, is not an issue right now, but with multipath quick, that will definitely be an issue. So BPF, eBPF has to be made use of mandatorily in that case to steer it to the right process, to the right socket with reuse port. Yeah, no, I, I agree that BPF is a useful addition. Um, yeah. I, yeah, the point of the slide is more to say that 
largely you can get by with SO reuse port and BPF is, a, is an improvement upon that uh, for cases when you understand what the connection ID structure is uh, for your application. Right, right. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. So on the graph up there that shows the dropout when you disabled quick due to the crypto bug you mentioned, the recovery is gradual. Is that because you gradually re-enabled the servers or is it because the clients needed to be updated? It's because the clients needed to be updated. And, and the rollout, that literally is the rollout of Chrome, uh, that particular version of Chrome with the fixed code. So this was a client-side bug. So how did the servers distinguish? You revved a version number somewhere? Uh, yes. Yeah. Okay. We use version numbering. Yeah. Uh, it's just a general question. So uh, from the web server perspective, I mean, um, compared to um, TCP over TLS, like, you know, is it actually consuming more um, CPU utilization right now, or are you actually saving it? It's, it's definitely still consuming more CPU, um, particularly uh, and possibly with, um, you know, a higher bandwidth connection with UDP GSO, that, that would actually ameliorate a huge portion of the issue, but um, certainly send costs are still uh, higher for, for Quick at the moment. Um, and at least in our Quick implementation, um, the implementation is less optimized. I can't comment on other people's. I know like at this point, um, multiple other organizations have Quick implementations and it's very possible um, that theirs are actually quite a bit more accelerated because in some cases, in the case of Microsoft, theirs was actually implemented by their kernel team. Um, and so they came into it with like very different perspective on uh, CPU optimization, I'm sure, than like our team did. Thank you. Which actually, just uh, a brief uh, side note from there. Um, there are a lot of other um, uh, organizations, as Ian mentioned, that are implementing and working on getting to the point that they can deploy quick. So this usage and the, and the problems that we are seeing right now are only going to get, um, uh, the voices are going to get amplified. So right now we have Facebook as an implementation, Fastly has an implementation. Um, there's Microsoft, of course, but it doesn't matter to this room. Um, but there are, there are, there are, uh, Cloud, who else we have? Is Cloudflare working? I'm not sure. Not, not Cloudflare, not that I know of, but okay. there's F5. Yeah. Um, and so there are several other uh, folks. Uh, Akamai is deploying also, uh, has deployed Quick as well. So there are large players that are deploying Quick, and it would be really good to fix these issues before they get to the point of trying to scale their deployments. Yeah. So uh, the with the UDP segmentation offload, right? So the user space has to really create the quick packets itself and then uh, pass the list of quick packets to the kernel, right? Yes. So does it help if uh, the segmentation also is offloaded to the the quick segmentation itself is offloaded to the kernel? Uh, instead of the user space having to do that? So that'll be harder to do in Quick because <laughs> the idea of segment, so the reason that segmentation works the way it does for TCP is because TCP is a byte stream. You just send a by, byte stream down, you send as many bytes as you want, the kernel can segment it wherever it arbitrarily wants. Quick has frames inside of a packet, mm -hmm. so the structure of, basically it, you can't segment this as an arbitrary byte stream. You would have to understand what those frames are and which frames need to go in the packet and break that stream at the correct boundaries. So basically at that point, the quick needs to be implemented in the kernel. Well, you need to be able to parse the frames and understand them, it, which is, it, yeah. The, the complexity would probably be, it would be substantially larger than the KTLS integration, but that would be the thing it would be most an, an, analogous to, is, because uh, KTLS creates, my understanding is t it creates TLS records, and so you'd have to know how to create, you know, quick stream frames, uh, package them into packets, uh, and then do both the regular encryption as well as the packet number encryption. So, I mean, that, the key point, I think, is probably that it would require crypto offload in order to even uh, consider kind of doing what you're, what you're describing. Yeah. You, yeah. Would, you would also need, uh, so th this, is, this is also why the, the more sort of the general API might be just, you know, the uh, quick can tell the kernel what offsets mm -hmm. to break this ad instead of trying to, instead of the kernel trying to parse this out. If the uh, if Quick can tell the kernel where to break the stream, yeah. then it's pa more plausible to do that. Okay, so maybe via socket option, maybe it may be possible to pass the offsets of the various headers to the kernel. Not as a socket option, but it would have to be something that goes along with the write. Mm -hmm. But yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay, thanks. 
So on that note, Joe Touch has this UDP options thing going on, of course where does. you have a fragment. <laughs> there are fragment options for UDP, so UDP will fragment and reassemble. Have you considered that? Is that not something you could use? For what? For this problem you just said, that Shreya just asked. So you have a UDP message, and you want the message sure. boundaries to be observed, right? And after that, Quake was going to do its own thing with the message. It knows. But can you move the mic down a little bit? It's hard to hear. So, yep. so you basically are still using UDP, so you still yes. have message boundaries, and the application knows what to do with the message as long as the message boundaries are observed. Yes. Right? And the problem is the, the message might be bigger, bigger than MTU, and then you have issues. No, we don't no. want that at all. Right. So, messages so, so the UDP options draft from Joe Touch has a fragment option which can be used to deal with the correct fragmentation reassembly at the UDP layer. Right? So is that something that you could potentially look into? Because I not. looked at Willem's card thing, right? The UDP segmentation thing is basically doing the same thing except the application is telling you where to chop it up. Yeah, so I think uh, my answer would be that when, I, when you look at the realistic, at least um, external internet, loss rates that we deal with. Um, even if we could get UDP fragmentation to work well, I think it would be a net loss uh, because we would end up uh, dropping so many UDP, like these large UDP packets uh, that it would be impractical. Um, so I think, yeah. I think the world where we're in now where um, we, we don't do fragmentation when we set the DF bit, I think is a better world. And if anything, I would prefer to go to a world where we actually have larger MTUs for UDP. Oh. Um, I don't know when that's going to happen, but someday. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I completely agree. The, the, it's important that we have the, the quick header. We want it to appear on every packet that's traversing the internet. That's the only thing we can use to do loss recovery with. UDP, even though the, the UDP options might support fragmentation, they're not going to do loss recovery for you. Yeah. And the whole <laughs> chunk is going to get lost, and we definitely do not want that. Yeah. <coughs> I have a question on the bridge. There's a question. Somebody, Somebody remote? remote? I can't. Uh, yes. Are you, I have a question you, on the bridge. Uh, you, you're, you're not on video? We Eric, your you. voice has changed. What happened? <laughs> <laughs> okay, go, go ahead. Um, I, I have a general question here. Um, I was wondering if there's any experience with uh, denial of service on quick servers. Like, you know, we are used to hearing about thin sluts with TCP. What? what what is the experience with Quick here? To, to my knowledge, uh, well, no, we've never experienced a denial of service attack that was significant enough that it was, I was notified of it. <laughs> so I, 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 I'm not you know, in touch. I, it, it, this is a good thing, but I am not closely in touch on a day-to-day -day basis with the Google DDoS team. And so all I know is that they haven't contacted me. Um, I will note that. In order for us to accept a, a quick handshake, you have to send us at least like a 1,200 byte packet, um, and so you can't really mount a sin flood. You still have to pr send pretty large packets to us, and then in response, we're only going to send you typically like three packets. Um, so I, I presume that people have decided that there are lower hanging fruit if they want to DDoS people. Yeah, and and also there's there's some value to having confusion out there, right? I mean, security by obfuscation isn't exactly useful always, but in this particular case, the fact that Google's deployment of Quick is different from the publicly documented IETF version of Quick and everything else might have attackers quite confused. So we might basically have, you know, they might be trying to attack us with something that we go, hmm. and uh, so it's it's that's also uh, plausible that it's happening, but we just don't see it as DOS. Hmm. Yeah, so you, uh, you know your protocol's a success when you start seeing major denial of service attacks and security calls popping up on, in the uh, New York Times. A <laughs> uh, couple comments. First of all, I think you kind of invalidated my comment about GRO. It sounds like we have to have the unencrypted um, quick data to reconstruct the stream. So it sounds like uh, in, in order to do anything interesting with quick in the kernel, you would need to do the, the TLS uh, or, or quick um, crypto offload into the kernel. Uh, but there's another reason to do that. So without that, you probably can't do splice. And for the rest of the world, um, most of us still run file systems in the kernel, so we like to splice from uh, file to network in order to serve video. Um, but one quick question on the MTU. So how far has Quick gone with some sort of MTU path discovery? 
or is it still assuming some minimal MTU on the internet? We're assuming um, the ITF documents assume a minimum of 1,200. Uh, Google Quick operates with uh, an MTU of around 1,340 because we found that the number of people you lose by going to maybe 1,350 um, from 1,200 to 1,350 is very, 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 very small. Um, and then, oh yeah, we have slides on that. Uh, <laughs> Um, and we actually implemented Path MTU Discovery, or sorry, uh, what is it called? The PLM, non ICMP based Path MTU Discovery. Um, and an early version just turned out not to work well, and so we didn't end up deploying it, uh, but we're going to probably revisit it in the future. But um, at, the, at the moment, the fact that we need a fallback anyway, and we're falling back for something like 7% of users, means that if we have to fall back for another 0.2%, the total kind of loss of impact is pretty small. Well, I mean, it might not be an issue moving forward anyway, because IPv6 has a minimum MTU of 1280. So if you just kind of, you could actually probably hard code that, and then IPv4, yeah, you're going to get some occasional drops, maybe deal with that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And John, I conveniently pulled up the, the packet size uh, data. So as you can see, we. We tar tried to target, like, there's a little spot, a little bump like, to the right of 1350. So we, we targeted somewhere around 1350. So, anyway, I think uh, we're out of time. Eric, any more question from your side or comment? Shall we go to handbook as uh, homework assignments now? Eric, any last comments? No, 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 nothing. Okay, so let's thank our speakers. Thank you. So it's going to be an early lunch.